We met today's guest two years ago, coming on the heels of her first novel, Inconvenient. Well, joining us today is Fairlawn resident Margie Gelbwasser, who's going to tell us about her latest novel, Pieces of Us. Welcome, Margie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be back here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Listen, Margie, you, you deal with some heady stuff here. When I was a kid, my sister used to read these romance novels where, you know, schoolboy crushes was all the rage, and that was pretty much it. Your first novel dealt with alcoholism. Now you're dealing with cyberbullying mm -hmm. and, um, and some other serious issues. Margie, why don't you tell us about that and how that plays into today's society? Well, I tend to um, write contemporary uh, literature, which is, you know, what teens are going through, because those are the kinds of books I always gravitated to as a kid. I mean, the romances and all that are still out there, and um, they're great for people that need a break from heavy stuff. But when I was a kid, I always liked yeah. the heavy stuff. Um, so with this one, I tackle, like I was saying, cyberbullying, because um, it's definitely reached new heights. It's, um, and cause bullying to reach new heights. And um, I also deal with abuse and dating violence, um, two issues that are big as well. Um, I, th I think it's important to address them because there's so many teens that are growing up with these things. And um, especially in the suburbs, I think that people think everything's so great for everyone that lives in the suburbs. And uh, there's so much that goes on behind closed doors that nobody knows about. And uh, I think it's important to talk about those things. Well, so Pieces of Us, a very uh, interesting title. How much of Pieces of Us is Margie Gelbwasser? Um, I wrote it all myself, but it's, <laughs> it's not uh, about me at all. I mean, definitely the first book was more autobiographical in the sense that it took place in a town that was based on Fairlawn. And, but this one, definitely uh, much more from my head than some things that I experienced, um, which made it easier to write, I think, um, the first one went through, I think, a lot of drafts because it was just so close to who I was that um, it was hard to make it fictional. Whereas this, I think I got just much more literary license because it wasn't based on uh, my life. Um, however, it does deal with cyberbullying. And you know, when I was a teenager, um, there's some people that spread rumors about me. And I had friends who that happened to as well. But back then, in the 90s, you know, somebody could call your name. Um, they may pass you a note, and then they will move on to something else, maybe in a few days, or at least you had the safety of home to go to. And right now, that's not the case. I mean, somebody will call your name, then they could text it to 100 people, and then email it to hundreds more. It spreads like wildfire, doesn't it? Exactly, and post it on Facebook, and post it on YouTube. And then somebody told me, which I didn't even know that you, they could take a picture of you and they could doctor it to make it look like you're doing things that you're not really right. doing. So I think it is so much scarier for teens these days because there's nowhere for them to really be safe, like the rumors and bullying. Just and it's true, and high school is such a, a big part of a, um, a young person's life. Mm -hmm. And their role in that school, where they are in the pecking order, is so huge, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think that. Um, you fall on the wrong side of that, and it, it, it just it just could ruin your life. And I and I just think too with bullying, um, you know, there's no secret formula really. Like the um, aggressors pick whoever they think would be a victim. Even if you show that you get upset in it, about it, you could become the new victim, and then um, they just continue with it because it's about power. So, um, yeah. Okay, you have an interesting family in Cherry Hill, a mom and two daughters. Why don't you read us an excerpt about um, um, how one of the daughters, the younger daughter, bought the mom a gift and the reaction she got from that gift. Right, so the dynamic here is that the mother favors the older daughter, right. and uh, this um, kind of explains that. The only cherries you see in Cherry Hill are in the supermarket. There are no hills blooming with them, no trees either. Back when it was first named Cherry Hill, the land was a farm. As far as I know, the farm did not grow cherries. My best friend Chloe says calling it Cherry Hill is ironic, but obviously words are not her strong suit. That's not what ironic means. No, the name Cherry Hill is a misnomer, misnomer and a sad one at that. Just ask my mom. She and her parents moved to the United States from some small, backwards Russian hole when she was in high school. They lived in Brighton Beach, New York, which made my grandparents ecstatic and annoyed the heck out of my mom. Living in Brighton Beach, where all the stores were Russian-owned, where there was no need to learn English, was the same as being back in Russia, she said. She was bigger than that. For college, my mom got a scholarship and went to California. She loved the glitz and said it was her kind of place. 
Somewhere along the way, she met my dad. By that time, the Cali glamour was burning her out. Dad was from Cherry Hill, and she thought there would be fields and fields of colorful flowers and cherry trees under which she could rest and dream. This place, she thought, would be all beautiful, the kind of place she deserved. When I was 10, I thought I'd fix things for her. Katie had just painted some dorky pic of a cherry tree, which Mom loved. No, more than loved, adored, revered. It seemed to make her crazy happy. That Mother's Day, I got us matching headbands with saved birthday and lunch money. Since Mom liked it when she and Katie wore the same styles, I thought it was the perfect gift. The headbands were silver in color, with red plastic cherries intertwined at the top and little green stems as accents. Mom put hers on right away and smiled real big. I put mine on too and ran to get a mirror so we could see what we looked like in these identical bands. Mom put her arm around me, small, uh, smile still on her face. Julie, honey, she said, I don't think this is quite right for you. I think you need to grow into it. Grow into a headband, I thought. What the heck did that mean? We'll get you one that works better with your coloring. A week later, she got me a new headband. It was brown and plain and not pretty at all. I put it on for her anyway, and she nodded. Perfect. One day you grow into the other one. Until then, maybe Katie should wear it? Katie took it. She wore it all the time. The cherries bloomed on her head the way they never would on mine. Even when Katie stopped wearing the cherries, two babies for high school, she said, Mom still kept it, and I thought her taking it out of her drawer to stare at them. To stare at them. She never gave the headband back to me. I'm 13 now, and I guess I still haven't grown into it. But each time she takes it out, she mumbles about being tricked and manipulated and glares at my dad. He says he never described Cherry Hill the way my mom says he did, that it was my mom's own creation. It really doesn't matter. Either way, she's stuck here, waiting for cherries that will never bloom. Yeah, very powerful stuff. And you can see, uh, reading that, I thought how perceptive children are and how careful you have to be as a parent on how you treat children equally. Isn't mm -hmm. that the case? Yeah, um, you know, I only have one, but I find that um, when I write, like being a parent myself now, mm -hmm. there's so many uh, things that you put into consideration and you just, you realize how attuned kids are to you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my son, he's going to be five this summer. And just little things, like he'll notice, he'll um, you know, come up to me and he'll know like when I'm in a bad mood and he'll give me a hug and he'll say, are you happy now, mommy? Does that make you happy? And it's so, you realize as a parent how much their, the kids' emotions are so tied into yours. Right. So, um, you know, I've learned to try to like, I don't want him carrying the burden of whether I'm happy or not. There's you know? a lot of tragedy in that. So. Uh, that uh, those paragraphs you just read us, mm -hmm. I'll fix her. You know, a child once again thinking that they can do something as simple as buying a headband to solve a major crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, a woman that's obviously resentful right. uh, for a choice she made. Yeah, and, and Julie, like throughout the whole book and in this scene, you could see that as well, that um, she, you know, just really strives to get her mother to love her the same way she loves the older daughter, you know, to wear the same styles too. You know, but even the mother just saying, you know, here's a brown headband that's much more appropriate for you than something really pretty. You know, that speaks volumes about what kind of person she is. Absolutely. And, you know, it's unfortunate, like, I was reading some things and some people said um, uh, that, oh, there's no parents like this, and why do people portray bad parents? And, you know, I love my parents, and I, I think there's plenty of good parents out there, mm -hmm. but I just tackle the ones that aren't. And there are parents who aren't, you know, who aren't good out there too. And I've seen, I, I had some friends who had parents that were far from um, ideal. Right, and as so, we said in the pre-interview, some characters will rise above it and because they're strong-willed. And some of them become the victim and play that victim part to the hilt. And they won't, they won't take um, accountability for themselves, will they? Uh, right. The Julie character, for instance. Right, exactly. Like I, I think sometimes when you grow up, I guess in a broken environment, mm -hmm. um, you, right, you could choose to be a better person or you could choose to use that environment sometimes as an excuse or just maybe even just not know better because nobody ever showed you what was better and then, you know, make bad choices. Right. Uh, um, tell me, what do you expect your young readers or your readers to, to take away from this book? What dialogue do you expect them to have or would like them to have? Well, this book, you know, is uh, for older teens. Um, mm -hmm. my, my first one I thought was appropriate for 12 and up. This one I would say 15, 16 and up. And um, I would really like 
the parents to read it with their teens if possible because I think there's um, with bullying and abuse that stuff happens a lot and um, teens feel that they can't speak up and bullies count on their victims to stay silent you know and they say um, that the bullying will stop or the abuse will stop right. if the victim just doesn't tell anybody or it will get worse if the, the bully victim. counts on that exactly right. exactly and the, or the bully will say if you say something you know things will get even worse but if the victim stays silent the bully Will, con will continue bullying them, they will not stop, mm -hmm. and the victim's own emotional health um, w will deteriorate too. And when I sign these books for people, like I usually sign it with uh, break the silence and, um, or stop the silence and bullying and abuse, because I think that that's really what I like people to take away from it, that you, know, you don't need to be silent. If you see it happening, do something. If it's happening to you, tell somebody, because it could only get better if people talk about it. Well, tell, tell us about that. Have you gotten any comments from young people? Have they come up to you with their stories? Well, I've gotten a few emails, actually, mm -hmm. yes, and um, where uh, some people have said that they were in relationships uh, like this and um, abusive relationships, and, you know, um, it meant a lot to them to have a book out there that spoke to what they went through. And, um, you know, I, I've had people tell me that their children were bullied and, um, having a book like this is important. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I feel if it um, even touches one person and makes them feel like they could get out of that kind of situation, um, that would be great. I, I believe confidence is the key into learning or doing anything successful, right? Having a good life. Your books, you, you discuss, in this book in particular, uh, quite expertly, you discuss um, insecurities. You describe mm -hmm. insecurities, uh, namely the ones between the siblings, the uh, Kyle and Alex, and the ones between Katie and Julie. Mm -hmm. uh, t tell us more about uh, tell us more about that. These insecurities and how one how one could rise rise above those insecurities. Um, one passage I remember: the girl was proud of herself because I guess maybe she was a little chubby, and she was proud that she mm -hmm. ate the apple slices and passed mm -hmm. on the French fries. Mm -hmm. After seeing how beautiful her sister was, she said, "I wish I had the French fries." Sort of mm -hmm. like gave into that, and that's a big problem in society, eating disorders and other disorders brought on by depression. Tell us right. a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I think um, as a teenager especially, we're so, um, um, we're so susceptible uh, to criticism. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that if it's really important to find something that you're really good at and find a strength and speak to that strength, you know, you don't have to be the prettiest or the skinniest right. or, you know, find whatever um, is something you're strong at and, you know, accentuate that. And, I, and that's good for the parents to know, too. I mean, you may want your child to be fantastic at baseball, you know, or any sport, but that's not his or her thing, you know. So they could be great at making origami. I mean, it doesn't even So you shouldn't matter. live vicariously like some of these characters do through their children. Right, exactly. I, I think that... Um, it's important to just uh, play up your strength, whatever that may be. And I think if, uh, part of the reasons I think that a lot of these characters don't make good choices or, you know, they become victims of abuse or think that um, in Katie's case, the only way out is to keep going back to the abuser mm -hmm. is because, you know, they, they don't have good self-esteem and nobody told them that there's, there's something more to them than, you know, just a pretty face. Right. Or, and with Katie, her mother especially focuses on, you know, you're just pretty. Yes. You know, j just go with that. And everybody has, you know, everybody's more than just smart or just pretty or, you know, just a good ball player. There's so many things and it's important to see ourselves as a three-dimensional um, and love ourselves for who we are. And something tells me now, you're also a teacher, you started teaching recently, something tells me that you're imparting that, that lesson onto your students. I try. I actually teach writing at uh, mm -hmm. a college and um, I teach uh, like writing 101 composition. Yes. And I have students who come there, most of them think that they really can't write. And um, we discuss how anyone could write because here's a format and mm -hmm. you know there's revision, we, we could all write it. And at the end of every class, I always get um, a few students that say, you know, I, couldn't, I never believed I could write a research paper. I never believed I could write this essay. And, you know, I always thought I was so horrible at writing. And thank you for, you know, showing me that I'm not. And, right. you know, I save those. And th that means 
that means a lot to me. You know, you don't have to write a novel, but everybody, you know, you, you try hard at something, I think you could do it, you know, too, so. What would you say to the person that uh, always wanted to write the great American novel, but just can't get up to it? It's a process, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, you know, my, fr my first book took uh, seven years from the very first draft to when it appeared on the shelves. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I kept trying, and even though the original, original is stuck in a grave somewhere of books, um, you know, it was good that I wrote it because I learned from it and I came up with Inconvenient. Whereas, you know, my second book, it took me only three months to do the first draft and then four more months of editorial revisions. And then maybe a month or two later, it was on the shelves. So um, I think you learn a lot through the process. And I, I think it, it just, it's just important. This is, if it's a dream of yours, it's important to do it and um, see that you could succeed at it. You could, if you think it's a craft issue, you could read books, you could take mm -hmm. classes, you could have critique group partners. Um, if you think you're great at the craft, just keep writing and rejections, it's okay, I got a lot. You just have to keep trying. Right, so. and sometimes greatness doesn't come easy, right? That's right, I'm still searching for it, so. <laughs> well listen, Margie Gelbwasser, proud, proud of you uh, being a Fairlawn resident and very proud of uh, you writing these two books. Uh, second, a novel very gritty, but I think I highly recommend it. I think it will open up a lot of eyes and, and give that voice and that strength to the, these people these, uh, so they're not victims any longer. They get power over their lives again. Thank you for joining us today, Margie. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, our pleasure.